From the bustling streets of Queens to the defiant, punk-infused echoes of Johnny Ramone's guitar, the journey of John Cummings, better known as Johnny Ramone, encapsulates the raw energy and rebellious spirit that would come to define one of punk rock's most iconic figures. Born into the urban landscape of New York in 1948, Johnny's early years in Queens and Long Island were set against a backdrop of post-war America, where the echoes of Elvis Presley, Jerry Lee Lewis and Fats Domino provided a soundtrack to his youth. The move to Stewart Manor in 1956 marked the beginning of Johnny's lifelong affair with rock and roll. The local bar's jukebox attendant unwittingly fueled this passion, handing over 45 revolutions per minute records that had run their course on the jukebox. These records, crackling with the energy of early rock pioneers, became Johnny's escape a rebellious counterpoint to the expectations of his parents. His defiance wasn't limited to his musical tastes. At 13, his family's nomadic life took them from Franklin Square to Jackson Heights and finally to Forest Hills in Queens. It was here amidst the shifting sands of his adolescence that Johnny's love for baseball and a burgeoning collection of baseball cards offered a semblance of stability. Yet it was his decision to attend military school in the ninth grade that hinted at the complex character Johnny was becoming. Opting for discipline and structure, he soon found himself chafing against these very confines, leading to a pivotal shift. His departure from military school and subsequent return to public education marked the emergence of a defiant, rebellious spirit that would come to define both his music and his persona. In the hallways of a high school in 1964, amidst the clamor of youthful ambition and the shifting tides of American culture, Johnny Ramone found a kindred spirit in Tommy, a fellow student with whom he shared an affinity for the raw, unfiltered sound of bands like the Stooges. This connection, rooted in a mutual appreciation for the burgeoning underground music scene, marked the beginning of a partnership that would eventually catalyze one of punk rock's most influential bands. Together, Johnny and Tommy ventured into their early musical experimentations with the Tangerine Puppets, a band that saw Johnny attempting to master the bass guitar. However, his transition from bass to guitar was anything but smooth. Frustration became a constant companion as Johnny grappled with the strings and frets, his attempts to coax melody from the instrument often ending in disappointment. Yet it was within this crucible of failed chords and abandoned attempts that the essence of Johnny Ramone's guitar style began to take shape. His struggle with the guitar was not a sign of defeat, but a prelude to innovation. The frustration and raw energy that characterized his early experiences with the instrument would later become hallmarks of his playing style, imbuing the Ramone's music with a sense of urgency and authenticity that resonated with a generation in search of a voice. As a teenager, he became emblematic of the angry, rebellious youth, navigating through his formative years with a penchant for trouble that saw him arrested for marijuana possession and engaging in acts of petty theft. This period of Johnny's life, characterized by drug use, drinking, and a general disdain for societal norms, seemed to set the stage for a path of self-destruction. However, at the age of 20, Johnny experienced a profound spiritual awakening that altered the course of his life. This moment of clarity brought with it a newfound determination to eschew the vices that had once defined his existence. The year 1972 marked Johnny's entry into the construction industry, courtesy of a job from his father, placing him at the heart of Manhattan's bustling streets at a building on 51st and Broadway. It was here, amid the concrete and steel of New York's skyline, that Johnny's path fatefully intersected with Dee Dee Ramones, who was then working in the mailroom of the same building. This job, which Johnny held for five years without missing a single day, reflected his newfound commitment to discipline and reliability. But beyond the daily grind of construction work, it offered him something far more valuable. A deepening friendship with Dee Dee and the opportunity to connect with Tommy outside the confines of their previous musical endeavors. Together, they ventured into the vibrant nightlife of New York, frequenting clubs to watch bands perform 
their shared experiences and love for music drawing them closer. It was within these dimly lit venues, against the backdrop of New York's eclectic music scene, that the foundation of the Ramones was laid. The trio's outings became more than just nights out. They were a crucible for creative exchange and mutual inspiration. Each band they saw, each note that resonated with them, served to cement their resolve to create something of their own, something that would challenge the musical norms of the time. Johnny Ramone's foray into the punk scene was as much about the music as it was about the personas that inhabited that world. His encounter with Johnny Thunders at Nobody's Bar in the Village captured the essence of what would excite and inspire him. Thunders, with his distinctive look and presence, embodied the special thing that Johnny aspired to. An unapologetic, raw energy that resonated with the streets of New York City. This encounter turned Johnny into a fervent admirer of the New York Dolls, a band that, much like Thunders, epitomized the gritty glamour and chaotic spirit of the city's burgeoning punk scene. In contrast, Johnny's perception of Kiss was markedly different. Despite acknowledging their entertainment value, he couldn't align their brand of showmanship with the cool, underground authenticity of the New York Dolls. This insight was transformative, shaping Johnny's approach to music. It wasn't about achieving technical perfection, but about creating something genuine and engaging with whatever skills one had. This philosophy would become a cornerstone of the Ramones' identity, propelling them into the spotlight, not on the strength of their musicianship alone, but on their unparalleled ability to connect with the raw, restless spirit of their generation. The genesis of the Ramones was not a sudden spark, but a slow burn, kindled by years of conversation and contemplation between Johnny and Dee Dee. Tommy, witnessing their potential and shared vision, nudged them from idle talk to action, offering not just encouragement, but a tangible way forward as their manager. As Johnny navigated the transition from a full-time construction worker to a punk icon, his life took a turn that seemed almost contradictory to the punk ethos he embodied. Marrying his girlfriend Rosanna and settling into an apartment in Forest Hills, Queens, Johnny's life began to mirror the very normalcy he once rebelled against. Yet, it was within the walls of this Forest Hills apartment that the Ramones' legacy would begin to take shape. This domestic setting became a crucible for creativity, where Johnny, Dee Dee and Tommy penned the songs that would lay the foundation for their first three albums. Johnny then lost his job after five years. This moment of uncertainty became the turning point that would lead him to fully commit to the band thing. With $50 in hand, Johnny purchased his first guitar from Manny's on 48th and Broadway. The band's original lineup with Johnny Dee Dee, Richie Stern on bass, and Joey Ramone as the drummer, quickly underwent changes as they realized the need for a more cohesive sound. Richie Stearns was let go, and Dee Dee was moved to bass. Rehearsals moved to performance studios in Manhattan, a hub of creative activity frequented by other influential acts like the New York Dolls and Blondie. This environment offered them the freedom to experiment, grow, and find their distinctive voice amidst the creative ferment of New York's punk scene. Their limited musical ability made it difficult to cover songs from other bands. The Ramones instead focused on developing their own sound, a raw, stripped-down style that emphasized speed, simplicity, and directness. Tommy's suggestion to transition Joey from drums to lead vocals was a stroke of insight. Joey's unique presence and voice, though not initially what Johnny envisioned for their frontman, became an iconic feature of the Ramones, embodying the band's embrace of the outliers and the unconventional. They held numerous auditions, but drummer after drummer turned them down, leaving the Ramones at a crossroads. It was in this moment of uncertainty that Tommy, initially the band's manager and visionary, stepped in to fill the void left by the absence of a drummer. Despite having no prior experience behind the drums, Tommy's natural rhythm and simplified style meshed perfectly with the band's raw, stripped-back sound. The stage arrangement Tommy proposed, with Johnny and Dee Dee flanking Joey, became a visual representation of the band's dynamic and chemistry. 
Dee Dee's inspiration for the band's name, drawn from Paul McCartney's pseudonymous check-ins as Paul Ramon, was a stroke of genius that encapsulated the essence of what the Ramones aimed to be, a unified front against the conventional norms of music and society. By adopting the surname Ramon, Douglas Colvin, Jeffrey Hyman, Thomas Erdely and John Cummings became Johnny, Joey, Dee Dee and Tommy Ramon. With Tommy Ramone solidifying the lineup behind the drums, the Ramones embarked on a rigorous regimen of daily rehearsals. Their lack of formal musical training and technical proficiency necessitated a simplicity in composition that became their hallmark. Songs were stripped down to their rawest elements, characterized by rapid tempos, minimalistic melodies, and a conspicuous absence of the elaborate solos that defined much of rock music at the time. The Ramones' early days at CBGB's, a then obscure bar in New York, marked the embryonic stage of what would become a punk rock revolution. Dee Dee's initiative to get them booked at CBGB's, a venue that was just beginning to open its doors to local bands, placed the Ramones at the epicenter of a burgeoning music scene. Playing weekly and charging just one dollar at the door, the Ramones initially drew modest crowds of 10 to 15 people. Yet these early performances were crucial in honing their craft and defining their identity. The decision to scrutinize footage of their shows was a testament to their dedication to improvement and professionalism. This self-analysis led to a change in Joey Ramone's stage presence. From an animated performer to the iconic image of him standing upright, clutching the microphone stand. A visual that would become synonymous with the band. The adoption of a uniform of jeans, t-shirts, leather jackets and tennis shoes was a deliberate move to foster a connection with their audience. The Ramones' approach to live performances revolutionized the concert experience, emphasizing an unrelenting energy that captivated audiences from the moment they took the stage. They opted for an explosive entrance that immediately seized the crowd's attention. The Ramones' performances were a relentless assault of sound and energy, encapsulating the essence of punk in every chord and chorus, leaving no room for the audience's excitement to wane. The division of responsibilities between Tommy and Johnny Ramone reflected a strategic organization that balanced creative fervor with practical management. Tommy's role in handling the band's dealings with the outside world allowed them to navigate the complexities of the music industry without compromising their artistic vision. Meanwhile, Johnny's stewardship of the band's internal operations ensured that their musical integrity and ethos remained uncompromised. This clear delineation of roles allowed the Ramones to function as a cohesive unit with each member playing to their strengths. The Ramones' journey to securing a record deal was fraught with rejection and adversity. The auditions for Sire Records and Arista Records, leading names in the industry, ended in disappointment as both labels decided against signing the band. The second showcase for Blue Sky Records in Waterbury, Connecticut, was a particularly harsh encounter with the reality of trying to break into a music industry that was, at the time, largely unprepared for the raw intensity and simplicity of punk rock. Not being listed on the bill set the stage for a hostile reception as the audience, expecting a different act, greeted the Ramones with boos and hurled bottles and cups at them. Blue Sky Records' decision to turn them down after such a tumultuous performance could have been a crippling blow to the band's aspirations. However, these early rejections and challenges served a crucial role in the Ramones' story, highlighting their perseverance and commitment to their identity as musicians. By the summer of 1975, their once sparse audiences had swelled into packed crowds. Johnny recognised that the band's success hinged not only on their individual talent, but on the cultivation of a broader punk scene in New York. This insight was crucial, prompting efforts to foster a community of like-minded acts that could collectively challenge the prevailing musical norms and create a vibrant, alternative cultural milieu. By championing this burgeoning scene, the Ramones helped pave the way for punk to emerge as a formidable force in music, influencing countless bands and reshaping the cultural landscape of New York and beyond. 
The transformation of their gigs at CBGB's into must-attend events caught the attention of Sire Records, leading to a reconsideration of the band's potential. They adopted the unique practice of recording album tracks in the same sequence as they were performed live. This method, while unconventional, ensured a cohesiveness and energy that mirrored their electrifying live shows, capturing the essence of the Ramones' live experience on record. Their debut album, Ramones, released in 1976, was a testament to this approach, offering an unfiltered glimpse into their sound and setting a new benchmark for punk music. The Ramones' first tour in England cemented their influence on the burgeoning punk scene in the UK. Their performances at iconic venues like the Roundhouse and Dingwalls in London were not just concerts, but cultural exchanges, fostering a sense of solidarity among punk bands across the globe. Returning to the United States, the Ramones embarked on a tour that expanded their reach to cities previously unvisited by the band, including Detroit, Atlanta and Los Angeles. In 1977, the Ramones made the unconventional decision to bring their girlfriends on tour, a move that diverged from the typical rock band narrative. This choice reflected their desire for a semblance of normalcy and stability amidst the chaos of touring life. Joey Ramone's struggle with obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, added a layer of complexity to the band's operations. His condition, which manifested in behaviors such as repeatedly going up and down stairs, often led to delays and frustration among the band members. Johnny Ramone's approach to the band starkly contrasted with Joey's personal struggles. Treating the Ramones not as a hobby but as a serious profession, Johnny imposed a strict discipline that was uncommon in the rock and punk scenes where lax attitudes towards punctuality and substance use were more the norm. The relationship between Joey and Johnny was complicated by Johnny's lack of understanding or empathy towards Joey's OCD. Johnny's primary concern was the band's performance and reputation, focusing on the practical implications of Joey's condition, rather than the personal struggle it entailed. In October 1976, as the Ramones prepared to record their second album, Leave Home, the band's dynamic and their individual lives continued to evolve in significant ways. Johnny would write the songs alone in his apartment and would bring the songs on a cassette tape to rehearsals for the rest of the band to learn. Johnny's perspective on the band's longevity was pragmatic, anticipating that the Ramones would have a finite lifespan of about five years, after which he aspired to transition into making low-budget horror films. The release of Leave Home in February 1977 and the subsequent US tour saw the emergence of Screaming Girls at their live shows, a stark contrast to their earlier performances. They knew they would begin to strike a chord with a much wider audience and demographic. The decision to replace Carbona Not Glue on the repressings of the Leave Home album was prompted by legal concerns from the Carbona company. Sheena is a punk rocker, not only replaced Carbona Not Glue, but also became one of the Ramones' most celebrated tracks. Their reluctance to spend excessive time in the studio was rooted in a practical approach to their craft. Conscious of the financial implications of studio time, they preferred to keep their recording process efficient and cost-effective. The recording of Rocket to Russia in a mere nine days is a testament to their efficiency and focus. Johnny's reflection on their New Year's Eve concert in 1977 at the Rainbow Theatre in London as their best concert underscores the importance of live performance in the band's legacy. Johnny's knack for analysing and understanding the nuances of stage performance was a significant asset to the Ramonas. His insight into how bands could improve their live shows indicates a deep understanding of the visual and performative aspects of rock music beyond just the auditory experience. This talent for discerning what made a performance compelling was part of what made the Ramones shows so powerful. The decision to decline Saturday Night Live's invitation to fill in for the Sex Pistols was due to their refusal to be seen as a second choice or a substitute. This principled stance, while potentially costing them a significant opportunity to reach a broader audience through one of television's most influential platforms, underscores the integrity and self-respect that defined the band's ethos. 
The departure of Tommy during their 1978 US tour due to a breakdown marked the end of an era and the beginning of a new chapter with Marky Ramone taking over on the drums. The decision to bring in Marky, despite concerns about his drinking, reflects the challenges and compromises bands often face in maintaining continuity and momentum. The band's appearance in the 1978 film Rock and Roll High School was a notable venture into another medium of entertainment. Johnny's admiration for Roger Corman's films played a significant role in their decision to participate. Opening for Black Sabbath and the experience at the Canadian World Music Festival in 1979, however, presented significant challenges for the Ramones. Their performance for audiences expecting the heavy metal sounds of Black Sabbath and the rock vibes of ACDC, Aerosmith, Ted Nugent, Johnny Winter and Nazareth highlighted the stark contrast between punk rock and other rock subgenres prevalent at the time. They received adverse reactions from the crowd who were not the typical punk rock audience the Ramones resonated with. Hiring Phil Spector, a legendary producer known for his wall of sound technique and work with various iconic acts, was a strategic move aimed at evolving their sound and broadening their appeal. However, Spector's focus on Joey Ramone and apparent disregard for the other band members exacerbated existing fractures within the group particularly between Joey and Johnny. Phil Spector's treatment of the Ramones was a mixed experience. While the band members were treated relatively well, Spector's behavior towards others during the recording sessions was reportedly abusive. Johnny also felt that Spector failed to capture their sound and vibe and list this album as one of the band's worst. The recording sessions for End of the Century were further marred by personal tragedy for Johnny, as his father passed away from a heart attack at the age of 62. Despite these difficulties, End of the Century was finally released in early 1980. However, the album's reception was mixed among fans and critics, who were divided over the band's stylistic shift. The introduction of Gary Kerfurst as their manager saw the band beginning to see an immediate increase in their earnings and exposure. Despite these changes and their hard work, the Ramones still faced challenges in achieving mainstream commercial success, particularly in terms of landing a big hit single. Johnny's realization that hard work alone was not sufficient to achieve significant commercial success speaks to the realities of the music industry, where label support and radio play are critical components of widespread recognition. The interpersonal dynamics within the band took a dramatic turn with Johnny's relationship with Linda, who had previously been involved with Joey. This development introduced a deeply personal layer of tension to the band's existing challenges. The decision by Johnny and Linda to keep their relationship hidden from Joey, coupled with Joey's stated intention to quit the band should he discover their cohabitation, underscored the complexity and sensitivity of the situation. The long-term nature of Johnny and Linda's relationship lasting over 20 years suggests a deep connection between them, Yet the circumstances under which it began undeniably cast a shadow over the band's internal relationships. Johnny was then attacked on the street by an acquaintance of one of his former girlfriends. This assault not only had physical consequences but also psychological ones, leading Johnny to begin carrying mace for self-defense. Marky's alcohol problem caused him to miss a gig in Virginia Beach, which set off a mini-riot outside the venue. Johnny was furious and fined Marky $5,000. Marky's continued struggles with alcohol during the recording of Subterranean Jungle in 1982 further compromised his ability to contribute to the band. His inability to perform adequately due to his drinking led to the difficult decision to fire him from the Ramones. The introduction of Richie as his replacement marked a new beginning for the band with a more talented drummer who could also sing backup. However, Richie's tenure with the band was not without its own set of challenges, particularly concerning financial disputes over merchandise revenue. These disagreements culminated in Richie refusing to play three shows in New York. Richie's eventual departure from the Ramones in the middle of a tour was a major setback. In order to keep momentum going with not much time lost, they brought back Marky on the drums who had become recently sober. 
Dee Dee Ramone's escalating drug problems and shifting interests culminated in his departure from the band in July 1989. His growing disinterest in playing the bass, coupled with a noticeable decline in his performance quality, reflected the toll that his personal struggles were taking on his professional capabilities. Dee Dee's foray into the hip-hop genre, marked by a change in attire and speech, represented a significant departure from the Ramones' established punk identity. Johnny could neither understand or endure this new persona, so they agreed to part ways and let Dee Dee explore his new identity on his own. The addition of CJ as the new bass player breathed new life into the Ramones. CJ's arrival came at a critical juncture, providing the stability and energy needed to extend the band's career. During the 1990s, as punk rock evolved and new bands entered the scene, many of these emerging groups cited the Ramones as a significant influence on their music. Johnny's reaction to the admiration and respect from these bands, letting his guard down and becoming less competitive and standoffish, indicates a shift in perspective. Recognizing the Ramones' role in inspiring new musicians fostered a sense of camaraderie rather than rivalry. Despite their struggle to achieve mainstream success in the United States, the Ramones found an enthusiastic and devoted fan base in South America, where they were celebrated with a fervor reminiscent of Beatlemania. This overwhelming reception included enthusiastic fans eager to physically connect with the band members and grab any piece of the Ramones they could get their hands upon. The significance of South America in the Ramones' career was further solidified when they received their first ever gold record for the Mondo Bizarro album in 1994. They knew their legend was growing when they finally received their first gold record in the United States for Ramona's Mania, a greatest hits compilation released years earlier. Their decision to release one more album, Adios Amigos, embark on a major tour and then disband marked the end of an era for one of punk rock's most influential and enduring acts. This farewell gesture was a deliberate and poignant conclusion to a career that had spanned over two decades during which the Ramones fundamentally altered the landscape of rock music with their minimalist approach, rapid-fire songs and unapologetic attitude. Despite struggling for mainstream recognition during their active years, their impact on rock music and the punk genre became increasingly appreciated over time. This posthumous acclaim highlights a common phenomenon in the arts, where an artist's or group's work gains greater recognition and appreciation after their career has ended, or, in this case, after the band ceased performing and recording. The delayed recognition of the Ramones' contributions to music can be attributed to several factors, including changes in cultural tastes, the band's influence on succeeding generations of musicians, and a growing nostalgia for the music of the 1970s and 1980s. The limited communication between Johnny and Joey Ramone after the band's dissolution reflects the deep-seated personal tensions that existed between them. Tensions that, unfortunately, were never fully resolved before Joey's death in April 2001 due to lymphoma. Dee Dee Ramone's death in June 2002 further compounded the sense of loss within the Ramones community. Two major losses in such a short period of time. Then. Johnny's struggles with prostate cancer began to take hold. His battle with the disease and subsequent death on September 15, 2004, at the age of 55, closed the book on the history of the Ramones, leaving only their drummers behind to tell the tale. Despite the personal differences and challenges they faced, the legacy of the Ramones as pioneers of punk rock remains undisputed. Their music continues to inspire and influence new generations of musicians and fans, a testament to the timeless appeal and relevance of their work. Johnny, a kid from New York, fulfilled all of his musical aspirations and then some. He leaves behind the tales of a legend and a pioneer, never wavering, never changing, and always staying true to who he was, the punk rock down picker.